Welcome to the next video in the evolution topic. This video will be looking at two dot points from the Life on Earth syllabus 8.4.41, explain the need for scientists to classify organisms, and 8.4.42, describe the selection criteria used in different classification systems and discuss the disadvantages and advantages of each system. So let's have a look at the first one, explain the need for scientists to classify organisms. So what are some reasons why we classify? Obviously, being able to classify things, we're able to identify, identify them as being different from other things. We're also able to see relationships between different things and to have an easy way to communicate what we know about these different things. As we move on, we'll be looking in particular, in particularly, sorry, at the binomial, binomial naming structure, where all organisms have a two-named Latin version of their name, which is the same around the world. And then that way we're able to identify um, what particular plant or animal or other type of species we're looking at, um, irregardless of the language that each different country speaks. So let's look at defining the term classification. So classification is the access or action or process of classifying something according to shared qualities or characteristics and the arrangement of animals and plants in taxonomic groups according to their observed similarities. So therefore, the science of classification is known as taxonomy, and taxonomists are those scientists who carry out the science of classification. So here we have just a really um, visual summary of how we classify humans. So humans, as we know, are animals, and they fit into a nice big group with all of those different types of things there. So we've got tigers and bumblebees, leopards, crabs, monkeys, giraffes, and rabbits. And then we can narrow that group down into a smaller group of cortada, which means that they have a spinal cord. So other organisms that join us in that group, we've got turtles, chipmunks, sharks, snakes, uh, lizards. Then we can break that cordata group down into a more specialized group known as the mammalia group, which humans share with dogs, cats, lions, tigers, bears, uh, otters, and then we can break that mammalia group down further into primates, which are groups of organisms that have binocular vision, an opposable thumb, which they can use to grip things, and a larger brain size, and then furthermore into the hominid group. So we can have a look here at how the hominid group has changed over time. And we've now got to our modern humans, which are known as Homo sapiens sapiens, which is our genus and our species name. And as you can see, the brain size is the big, probably the most noticeable thing there about humans in comparison to the other hominid group. Also, the fact that we have a nice upright stance, our face is somewhat shorter, and um, we're able to walk on two legs, which all of them can here. But if we have a look at this table, we can see the features for each of the levels that puts us into the kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, and species that we are known to be in. So the kingdom animalia means that we are a multicellular eukaryote. So all of our cells have a true nucleus, as well as other membrane-bound organelles, such as the mitochondria. We are heterotrophic, meaning that we need to take out uh, nutrients from somewhere else, and we have no cell wall. The phylum that we are in is chordata, which means that we have a notochord, a dorsal nerve cord, which is our spinal cord, and pharyngeal, pharyngeal splits, slits. Sorry, These disappear during the embryonic stage, but when we are in that embryonic stage, we have these pharyngeal slits that help us to breathe whilst in the womb. We fall under the class mammalia, so we have a fine layer of fur over all of our body, and also mammary glands are present, which are used to help to feed the young. We come under the order of primates. So as I said, we have binocular vision, so we see with two eyes. We have an opposable thumb, which means that our thumb can move across the whole span of our palm in order to help us pick things up, and we have a large brain. The family that we're in is the hominid family, which uh, all of the organisms in this group have reduced canines and larger molars. There's no tail. We have a flatter face, a larger brain, an erect stance, and our arms are shorter than our legs. Then our genus Homo, our spine has a slight S-shaped. We're bipedal, meaning that we walk on two legs. And again, that flattened face um, comes in. 
And lastly, species sapien, meaning we have a large cerebrum in order to be able to undertake logical thought and uh, in particular speech, and we have a great learning power. So let's have a look at that second dot point, describe the selection criteria used in different classification systems and discuss the advantages and disadvantages of each. So the biological classification system was developed over 200 years ago. And as we know from our research or our learning in this evolution topic, we know that since that time, an enormous amount of new knowledge has been discovered, which has from time to time required changes in the way that we classify life. So we began with the two kingdom classification system in 1735, which is developed by Carl Linnaeus. So he divided all living things into the following kingdoms, the kingdom veg vegetabilia, which are all immobile organisms, and kingdom animalia, which was all organisms that were able to move. So this helped to originally, I, well, sorry, originally organize all living things into these groups. However, it did not ac account for immobile animals, such as barnacles or conjovoi, which live mostly in water, and it was difficult to classify unicellular organisms. So remember in 1735, we did have the introduction of the light microscope, but it was quite a, um, a simple piece of technology. So we weren't really able to look at those unicellular organisms in much detail. In 1866, Ernst Haeckel brought in the three kingdom system by suggesting a new kingdom for unicellular organisms being the protista. So this was added to the two original kingdoms, which had also been renamed. So kingdom plantae, which was made up of plants and fungi, kingdom animalia, made up of animals, and kingdom protista, all other organisms, including bacteria, unicellular organisms, and cyanobacteria. This system separated prokaryotes from eukaryotes and separated out unicellular organisms many of which have plant and animal properties. However, at this point, fungi was still grouped in with the plants. So the Four Kingdom system came along in 1956 with a scientist whose name was Herbert Copeland, who emphasized the importance of prokaryotes by proposing the kingdom Minera being added as the fourth kingdom. So remember by this time, we would have now had the introduction of the electron microscope, being able to have a look at the organelles inside our unicellular organisms. So in this, king, in this system, sorry, fungi were separated from plants as it was discovered that they do not photosynthesize. A disadvantage of this system, however, is that unicellular and multicellular organisms were sometimes still grouped together. So this brings us to the, fifth, the five kingdom system. Robert Whittaker proposed a fifth kingdom, the fungi, in 1969. So by now this time, we had five kingdoms and they were kingdom plantae, which was made up of multicellular autotrophs, kingdom animalia, which was made up of multicellular heterotrophs, kingdom protista, all unicellular organisms and some algae, kingdom monera, which was made up of the prokaryotes, so those that didn't have a true nucleus and didn't have any true, or oh, sorry, any membrane bound organelles, and kingdom fungi, which was the multicellular saprotrophs who use enzymes to digest and absorb food. So this is the most accepted classification system. It classifies very diverse organisms in an, in an ordered scheme, so evolutionary relationships are apparent. We have also had the sixth kingdom added by Carl Woese and his colleagues uh, in seven, 1977, who created a different classification system based on RNA. He divided the prokaryotes, being kingdom Minera, into the RK bacteria and U bacteria based on RNA and other biomolecular information. The six kingdoms that are now recognized are the kingdom Plantae, again made up of multicellular autotrophs, kingdom Animalia, made up of multicellular heterotrophs, kingdom Protista, made up of all unicellular organisms and some algae, kingdom Fungi, which is made up of multicellular saprotrophs. Kingdom U bacteria, which is made of prokaryotes, and Kingdom RK bacteria, which is also made of prokaryotes. So U bacteria and RK bacteria were divided based on the RNA that was found within them. And that brings us to the end of this video, and thank you for watching.